Welcome to the podcast. I'm so happy you're here again this week. And I'm really excited to dive into today's topic. I want to share with you the three must-haves that you will want to incorporate into your lead generation routine so that you've got a really effective, easily repeatable, and results-creating lead generation routine. This comes from me working with so many of my independent consulting business owner clients and the themes that I see across so many consulting businesses, usually how we're overcomplicating things and procrastinating as a result. So today I want to dive in and share with you those three must-haves that you want to make sure you've got in your lead generation routine and um, help you to implement that in your business And I'll share with you an example too, so that you, we really bring it to life and you can go away from this episode, put it into practice and start seeing results um, by way of more leads for yourself with that. Hey, before I want to dive in though, I meant to, to tell you, I just wanted to say thank you so much to Courtney who left a review on the podcast in Apple. She said, Melissa, this is a little bit long, but it's so, um, so appreciative of it. So I will share with you the whole thing. Melissa packs an impressive amount of helpful ideas into a 30-minute period. Most episodes start with high-level thoughts and then drill down into specific examples, specific tips, and specific pitfalls. Specific is the key word because Melissa's because consulting is a broad topic. And while Melissa acknowledges that the path to consulting success should vary by individual. She doesn't leave it at what, find what works for you. She understands that her audience is listening to learn from her experience and to be able to apply it to their business. So I just want to say thank you so much to Courtney for that really thoughtful and um, specific, I'll use your word back, your specific uh, um, uh, testimonial rating, rating and review. And I just really appreciate you taking the time to leave that. I love doing this podcast and to see um, that that type of uh, feedback makes, makes it all worth it. So with that, let me kind of give you an example of why I picked this topic for this week. I thought I'd share a story of a client. I'll call her Jane because I never share client specifics on this podcast by name, but I really want to give you an example. I'd love to share these kinds of tangible examples with you so that you know you're not alone as you are implementing this, uh, you know, implementing and, and, and dealing with challenges in your business. So with that, let's talk about what was happening for Jane. She was essentially kind of a, a little bit stuck. She had landed several clients through past colleagues and employers and was ready to set up something more official, more kind of standardized as her official lead generation process um, so that she knew her business would be more sustainable and less dependent on that network. You know, after she had those first couple of projects under her first under her belt in, you know, in that first 18 months of business, she really wanted to, you know, take it up a level and know that she was in control of finding and landing her own clients. And so before we started working together, she had kind of sketched out a lead generation process on her own. It it consisted of a couple of hour block of time on Fridays set aside for things like networking, speaking, maintaining relationships, honestly fumbling around on LinkedIn a little bit, you know, just a little bit of a mismatch of a lot of different things. And so she wasn't really sure what if what she was doing would work or, or sometimes even what she was doing, just a little bit unsure. And noticed that she was actually just trying to implement all the advice that she was hearing from other independent consulting business owner colleagues and, what, and uh, layered on to, you know, what she had been reading on the internet and what she thought she quote unquote, should be doing. And so that's how this sort of mismatch of opportunity of um, activities was created, how she had created it and how she was trying to spend that block of time that she had set aside on Fridays. But at the end of the day, really, she was sporadic at best. 
definitely feeling more like she was going through the motions and not really fully in control of creating leads. And like she was, you know, spinning her wheels and wasting her time. So that felt really frustrating and overwhelming because as your time is so valuable, so was hers. And she felt like she was checking the box um, when she was doing, you know, this work on Fridays and then beating herself up if she wasn't doing the work on, you know, when she had set it aside. So this may sound really familiar to you. I hear this kind of a story from so many independent consulting business owners. And quite frankly, I was in this kind of cycle, spin cycle myself back in the day. So, you know, when Jane and I started working together, she thought her problem was that she just didn't know how to, how to meet clients, how to talk with people who weren't in her warm network and very specifically had pinpointed that as what she thought her issue was and wanted some specific help with that. How do I meet kind of colder Um, or cold, uh, brand new people and get to the place in a conversation where it really is clear that they need my help and advance the conversation forward. That's what she thought she needed help with. And I said, great, let's, um, let, we'll work on that. But first, let's just make sure that you've got some solid fundamentals in place for your business. And so I started digging in and asking her a lot of questions about our business and our business goals And as we went through that process, we both realized what she was missing. It wasn't the specific, like, how do I talk to strangers um, concern that so many of us have. I laugh because it's, it's, uh, it's such a common thing. How do I talk to these strangers that I don't actually know yet? But that wasn't the, that wasn't the challenge. The challenge for her was actually before that in the process. And it was that she had never formulated her business development metrics. And I'll tell you what those mean here in a minute. But without these business development metrics, it was no wonder she was spinning her wheels. And so I'm going to walk you through today how Jane and I addressed that and created her metrics and put these as three essentials in place for her business so that you can replicate the same thing for your own business if you're missing this, which quite frankly, almost every consultant uh, is that I've met and worked with and uh, talked with. So with that today, our agenda, I always love having an agenda, even when we're meeting here, here on the podcast, the agenda is that we're going to talk about these three must-have elements for your effective consulting lead generation process. So the first element is beginning with the end in mind. So we'll share with you that exact process of creating your business development metrics. The second element is you want to keep it simple and over avoid overcomplicating it. So I'm going to talk with you about what that actually means. And then thirdly, we can never forget this step to cultivating a business development mindset. Because no matter what strategy you have in place, it could be the sexiest, most effective strategy out there. If you don't have the right mindset from which you're operating it, it's going to fall flat. So I want to make sure that You've got that process to develop a, and cultivate a, 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 an effective business development mindset so that it's really ma- you're able to maximize the amount of time and the effectiveness of whatever you put in place. So those are the three elements that we're going to dive into today. And we're going to start off with this first element, which is begin with the end in mind. Stephen Covey, right? I don't know when he published that book. I should go back and look, but I know for sure I read it in the 80s, I think. Um, loved, loved that book and still do. And it's so, so important as part of our business to really know and get crystal clear on what we're trying to create in our business, what the quote unquote end is. So one way to think about what the end is, is really reverse engineering. How many, so we often do this backwards, Right. Instead of one thinking about the end in mind, like I know for sure I want to have, I'll just give you an example from Jane, right? I want to have four, part of her business plan was I want to have four advisory type clients this year or in the next 12 months. 
a lot of times we don't even go to that step of defining what the what that those business fundamental metrics are. We just kind of like go through them, go through the process and take whatever comes to us and whatever we get and then hope it kind of builds up to something we like. That's the normal process I see so over and over and over again, consultants doing, you know, taking that approach to their business. And I want to make sure you avoid falling into that trap. So this first step, begin with the end in mind, is for you to back into how many, you know, first start with how many clients of a certain engagement type you want this year. So for example, with Jane, her advisory type engagements, she wants four of those. So we sat down and I asked her some really simple questions. We'll put these in the show notes for you. And that is, first of all, if you were to land four of these advisory type clients and the average contract value, let's just say a 60K, that means that you're making 240K off of that revenue stream. Does that mean, or does that portion of your business mean that you're going to hit your revenue goal? So that's the first question. So let's just keep it simple and just say for now, Jane actually has some more revenue streams, other types of engagements, but just to keep it simple, let's just focus on this advisory. So the first double check is, okay, if I land four of these advisory role uh, uh, engagements and they're each worth 60K, does 240K in that type of revenue um, track me to my overall revenue goal? Yes. The answer from Jane was yes. Okay, great. So ask yourself that same question. Figure out how many of this engagement type you're going to need in order to either hit your, fully hit your revenue goal or contribute what you need to, to, you know, along with other engagement types to your revenue goal. So then from there, what you want to ask yourself is, what is my typical close rate for these type of engagements? And just to be clear, I'm uh, two things. I am, let me take a pause for a moment before we go into close, close rate. I will put a visual for you in the show notes so that you can see. I'm looking at at a chart right now to help walk you through this. So if you are visual like I am, you can go to the show notes and see this exact chart that I'm walking you through. Um, I also record all of these podcasts on and put them on YouTube. So if you're more visual, you can see slides that go along with all of the podcasts um, when you go listen over there as well. So Okay, so back to what we're talking about. We know in Jane's example, she wanted four advisory type clients that would drive 240K in revenue. And so the next question we asked her, you know, that she and I talked through was, what's your average close rate for this type of engagement? Now, she roughly knew it was 50%, so we went with that. You might not know the answer. So you're gonna have to make an educated guess. Definitely don't just throw up your hands and say, I don't know. Um, I don't have enough data yet. I haven't sold as many of these types of engagements yet. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know where to start. All that stuff is total bullshit. <laughs> BS. I, I don't know if this is a kid-friendly show or not. We'll go with BS. So that it's not, that's not going to help you. So if you don't know the number, then just pick one. Like, Start with 30%. That's a great place to start. Um, or if you kind of have an idea from other types of engagements you've sold in the past, think about it from that perspective and just make an educated guess. We're just starting somewhere, right? So then once we know, so in Jane's example, we know she wants to sell four of these this year and we know her close rate is 50%. So that means she needs to talk to eight of these of of potential clients who have a potential opportunity. This isn't just like a general conversation, right? This is a qualified lead. She needs to have eight of those. That they're truly considering hiring someone to come on for advisory type engagements. Eight of those conversations this year to create four clients. So that's the first thing. And then the next, or I don't know if it's first, but that's the next one we did, right? How many, how many real opportunities need to be, need to, um, do she need in her pipeline based on her close rate? Again, that's eight. And then we, then we say what the next question is, okay, well, how many conversations do you typically have in order to create eight opportunities? 
So for example, a, com a conversation might be a networking call. It might be a catch-up call with someone in your organization. It might be a speaking engagement that creates kind of, you know, sidebars. My, those are the types of things that are conversations. So how many conversations do you typically need in order to create a true qualified lead is the question. So in Jane's case, the answer was roughly six. I need to have about six conversations in order to create an opportunity, like a really truly qualified lead where they are truly interested in hiring someone to do these advisory services. Okay, great. So that means we need 48 conversations this year in order to create the eight qualified leads, close 50% of those to create the four advisory clients. Hopefully you're tracking with me here. Again, go look at the show notes for this chart. It's right there all for you. So then let's just break that down. If you need 48 conversations per year, if my math is correct, that's four per month. Actually, that's two per month, isn't it? I think my math is wrong on this chart. I'll fix it before we upload it. 48 conversations needed per year. So 12, um, Okay, so from that perspective, we Jane needs 48 conversations this year to drive those eight qualified leads or eight qualified opportunities. So that breaks down to four conversations per month. Four times 12 is 48, yeah? <laughs> so great, four conversations per month. And then if you broke that down even further, one per week. And that gives us a couple of weeks off also, right? So that's it. One conversation per week to ultimately create eight opportunities to ultimately create four clients. So now we have a starting point. Now we have a starting point to say, you know what? I have, a, have some, it could be really uh, informed off of your past history, or it could be a starting point guess. But either way, you have these business metrics, these foundational metrics against which you can start running your lead generation process. Not only does, does this make it tangible, but it also makes it so um, much more doable, right? We think, oh, all I need to have is one conversation a week. That's so doable. Or I could do three, three a week or something and take a couple of weeks off, right? Uh, and focus a little bit more on delivery on those other weeks, whatever that might look like for you. So it, it makes it tangible and also so much more doable. So that's what it looks like to begin with the end in mind. So you're just going to want to repeat this. If, you know, like Jane, for example, I mentioned she has other offerings, other engagement types, you might also. So just repeat that for each of your offerings and get yourself to a buildup where you really understand how many Conversations you need to have, loosely termed, right? The word conversation that leads to the number of qualified opportunities that leads to the number of clients. And then you've got a really good hypothesis from which to operate your business and figure out, is this working or we're somewhere where my assumptions off and I need to adjust? Maybe I'm getting too many leads. I can take the numbers down. Or maybe I'm getting not enough leads and I can adjust the numbers up. But it gives you that hypothesis. So this is, when you're breaking your business down in this way, you're going to get very clear on exactly what you need to be doing to generate that number of leads that makes eventually makes hitting your revenue goals inevitable and make sure that you're attracting the kinds of ideal clients that, are, that want to hire you for the exact type of work that you love doing. No more just taking and settling for whatever comes to you. Okay, so that's the first important element in your effective lead generation routine. The second is let's just keep this thing simple. Oh, get those metrics that we just walked through. We know Jane needs to have one conversation per week to fill and maintain her pipeline. 
So for her, the way she kept it simple was we just kind of did a brainstorm. What are all the different ways that you could fill, have those conversations? Some are kind of brutal, like cold calling or messaging people on LinkedIn and that they never reply or sending cold emails. Some are more interesting to Jane, like speaking and you know, having a speaking gate engagement once a month or hosting an executive round table or just literally going into her LinkedIn connections and and talking with people she knows and hasn't hasn't been in contact with for a while. So we just really brainstormed all the ways she could create conversations. And then we just eliminated what she just flatly didn't want to do. I don't want to call, cold call, cold message, cold anything. People just cross it off the list. Some people love that. It doesn't, there's nothing wrong with it. Just different, different, um, whatever aligns to you as, as the business owner, it feels a little bit lighter and easier and you think would resonate with your ideal clients. So that's the second component of this. Once you kind of figure out what, what do I like doing? What do I think my ideal clients would love to hear? What method? Is it, you know, ask yourself questions and we'll put these in the show notes also. Where does my ideal client congregate? Are they, you know, are they um, all in some kind of an association that you could um, join and speak at, for example? Does your client spend time online, like on LinkedIn or um, some other platform like Medium or something like that? Where do you most enjoy meeting new people? And how do you most enjoy catching up and maintaining relationships? Asking those questions of yourself, both of you personally and of your ideal client, and then design your process in a way that aligns with most, most with what you enjoy and also with your ideal client's typical behaviors. I'm there's there. I don't know about hundreds, but there's definitely dozens and dozens and dozens of different ways to create uh, conversations with potential clients. And so let's not pick the hardest one or the one you hate the most. Let's pick the one that feels at least the, the easiest to you and that you think your ideal client would really resonate with and start there. And you may already know what that is and just need to do more of it more consistently, or you might need to do a little bit of trial and error to figure out what that means. But what I will say to you is avoid these two traps, which is number one, looking for something that's comfortable. For mo- for you, most likely, business development isn't one of your most advanced skills. So you're most likely going to be somewhat uncomfortable with this process, no matter what type of method you choose. And that's okay. We're not trying to avoid discomfort. We're just trying to f- Pick something that is the least uncomfortable. Quite frankly, if it was incredibly comfortable to you, you would either be doing it, so you would need to be listening to this exercise, this uh, podcast, or it might just not, it might not, it might be really comfortable for you, but it's really not effective. It doesn't resonate with your ideal clients. You've got to have that intersection. And then also notice when you're sabotaging yourself. That's the other trap you're going to want to avoid. And by that, I mean, Thinking these thoughts about like, oh, this isn't going to be enough. This is too easy. It won't work. Whatever you chose. I should set up some. I love this. This one's such a a catchy one. Uh, One to catch for yourself. I should set up something that's more automated or scalable. And so therefore you think like old, old school networking isn't going to work for you. I can assure you. In looking at so, so, so many independent consulting businesses, the people who are willing to roll up their sleeves a little bit, go to speaking engagements, host webinars, host roundtables are so much more effective than those who are trying to run a Facebook ad or something that they, you know, some sexy automated strategy they heard about online that doesn't apply to your type of business. You're not running an online business where you're trying to bring in, you know, cheap leads. That's not what we're doing here. So making yourself think that you're doing something wrong by not having a scalable system that's automated is sending you in the wrong track. There may be a, a, an exception or two based on what your engagement types are. So don't take that as like the hard and fast rule, but it's usually like 2% or something of 
consultants, independent consultants, business models that where you could run ads or, or automate your process. We're doing high touch, high quality here, not um, mass marketing. Okay. So the third and final element that you want to include in your effective consulting business uh, development and lead generation process is establishing and cultivating your mindset, your business development mindset. And this is a mindset where you, I, I like to really call out five key elements here, that you believe ahead of time that you'll achieve the results. Most people wait. Most people do it the opposite way. We wait until we get the results to say like, oh yeah, I was right. I was skeptical up till the point I got the results. And then once I did, I was like, yes, that's the right answer. In order to make this the most effective lead generation process you can possibly implement and leverage your time in the most efficient way possible, you've got to believe that ahead of time that your hypothesis is going to work. That by talking in James' example to one person a week, she's going to create more than enough leads, but at least at least eight of them qualified leads to create four clients. So this, re- this requires believing in something that doesn't exist yet, but really believing that your results are inevitable versus maybe they'll have it. The second effective lead generation mindset component is to acknowledge and override that inner critic. There's going to be a lot of second guessing. Oh, I shouldn't do it this way. This won't be enough. All those things I just shared with you, right? This should be automated. I should be doing this differently. That second guessing and the doubt and the overwhelm, that there's nothing wrong with it. Let me be clear. I don't think there's ever a time that you, you that you'll get rid of it. I haven't in the last 10 years of my business. I work with my own coach who I think she's at 36 million or something in revenue a year. She says this never goes away. So I truly believe the inner critic isn't going to go away. So I didn't say get rid of eliminate the inner critic. What I did say is be able to acknowledge the inner critic cuz it gets really um Once you're able to manage it, it gets a lot more crafty in terms of the way it tries to trick you and keep you in the status quo. So you've got to get to the place where you're acknowledging and have that skill set of overriding the inner critic. And then the third component of that lead generation mindset is embracing the discomfort. Be willing to be uncomfortable. It's not a problem that you feel awkward or weird or incompetent or any of those things. What is a problem is if you allow it to make, to stall or you to procrastinate or you to decide, you know, not to do whatever it is that you chose to do from a lead gen perspective. The fourth element is having a healthy relationship with failing, meaning you're willing to fail and quite frankly, encourage setting up your processes in a way that you probably will fail in order to get that data, in order to to validate or invalidate your hypothesis and adjust from there. And then are you committed to achieving the outcome no matter how long it takes? Those are the types of things that you want to have in that effective lead generation mindset. And this is a lot of a little slightly different wording, what we discussed in that last episode. Actually, it was two episodes ago. Episode, I think it was 63. Um, where we talked about the six C's of a, cons- of a consulting business owner mindset, someone who doubles their revenue, someone who grows their business year over year, someone who creates predictable income, those six C's. So if you haven't yet listened to that, we'll put the link to that in the show notes as well. So that's what I have for you today. Those three elements are so incredibly important to you. The difference between having a um, feast or famine type of a lead generation process, a stagnating lead generation process, a lead generation process that is really fits and starts for you versus a predictable, sustainable, healthy lead generation process. And I want to remind you 
to go take the independent consultant business predictability assessment. So this helps you look at these types of areas in your business, lead generation and four other and three other components. So you can really uncover both within lead generation, like we were talking about today, and the other three components of your business to figure out where specifically you will find the most impact of focusing in on so that you can create more money in your business, more impact, and have more freedom as you're doing it. So be sure to go to IC, the letters IC for independent consultant, scorecard.com, and you can take that assessment. Thank you for tuning in this week. I hope that you'll go put this work into action so that you can have a more effective lead generation process. And I will see you again next week. I have to tell you, next week's episode is amazing. I interview an independent consultant um, that I can't wait for you to hear what she has to share with you in terms of her lessons learned as an independent consultant over the last 10 years. So wait for that episode. It's a great one. And I can't wait for you to listen to it. See you again next week.